our session. I know it's a little bit early today, um, but uh, we have a pretty good session for you guys today. Uh, my name is Stuart Long. Uh, I work for Salesforce. I've been with Salesforce now six years. Uh, actually, this will be my sixth Dreamforce that I presented at also. Um, and in that time, I had the pleasure of working with both uh, AJ and Chris Bennett. Um, uh, it's a handful of times in presentation and working with their agencies. Uh, and they're the uh, respective founders and CEOs of their companies. And today, you know, every year we come back and say, hey, how can we change it up? How can we update? How can we give some nuggets of information that what SEOs are doing in the trenches to, to give you guys something that you can go back to your companies and, and apply back, uh, back when you get back. And, you know, what I wanted to do is something a little different this year is do a little bit of a, since it's an early session, 9 a.m., so at least we've ever presented that, is do a little bit of show and tell. Um, so, not a lot of you guys can actually see this, especially you guys in the back. This was the cell phone that literally was in my pocket 10 years ago. I did the research, right? So it came out in 2006. A lot of you guys will remember this. Uh, I had it for about two years. You know, the clamshell design. Um, flip it open, that's the security. You know, you press it three times to get to a letter, four times to a number, no emojis, you know, no apps. You had an app calculator and alarm, you were happy about that. Uh, battery life was whatever, camera sucked. You know, if the reception was bad, you had to pull up the antenna. Funny, right? But that was what we had 10 years ago. And this will just give you a point of reference what we're going to talk about today. How technology has quickly changed in just 10 years, in one decade, and to give you something tangible to look at. Where well, we're going to talk about something that's less intangible, right? Something that's SEO. That's something that we can't actually grab or press buttons or use an antenna and pull up the reception and change our search listing, right? And that's changed significantly also. Even though we don't see it, we don't stare at our screens, we, don't, we can't compare it to a phone that we had two years ago, SEO's changing dramatically. And you know, AJ can attest, Chris can attest, I can attest, we've been in the game for a long time. That, you know, 10 years ago, if you did four things, you were, you were on it. You got no budget, right? 10 years ago, no budget. Paid search was barely a marketing tactic back then. So if you did these four things, keywords, content, meta tags, and backlinks, you were ahead of the game, you were probably dominating your search. And that's just all to say, you know, things are changing, right? How we used to access Google was a clickety clack keyboard, right? We still kind of have that. A CRT monitor, you know, a humming tower right next to us in a, in a, you know, a Target desk that we probably had in the corner of our living room. But now we have, you know, tablets and phones where we're swiping. We don't have a clickety clack uh, keyboard anymore. We're actually swiping and clicking on the screen itself. And you know, the algorithm is SERP. The SERP is a search engine result page. We'll respond to that a few times if you don't know what that is already. That's changed significantly also. What used to be just four or five, maybe a dozen ranking signals are now hundreds, right? Um, now there's technical requirements where site speed matters. You know, is your site mobile? Um, is, uh, you know, are you using HTTPS versus HTTP? These are all now ranking signals that didn't exist in years ago. Um, you know, Things that matter don't matter now. Yahoo, you know, where's that now? Ten years ago was, you know, one of the biggest players. Alpha Vista, Meta Keywords, if you're optimizing towards that, that's not working. Dmoz, um, a bunch of different things that don't work maybe six or seven years ago. Now, now, you know, that did work six or seven years ago that don't work now. You know, and then Penguin, Panda, Payday, Hummingbird, all these giant algorithm updates that Google launches out whenever they feel like it changes the SERP in real time. So it's not just, you know, and they're taking into consideration a lot of this different, uh, 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 these ranking signals and changing it as we serve the web, right? And that's just not to even talk about the devices that we use, the data that we don't have access to, we're not talking about AMP and LSI, and all these different things, right? And then, you know, if you were watching Mark Benioff two days ago, he talked about the fourth industrial revolution. And a lot of that is coming up based on machine learning and artificial intelligence. So that's not only going to change how we work, but that's going to change how you optimize the search. Probably less important, but it's still something to be aware of, right? So machine learning, again, we talk about, you know, we were on a physical keyboard in our desktop. Now we're on our, our, our phones and our bed, right? Swiping. And now we're going to be talking to Alexa. We're going to be talking to Google Home. We're going to be asking, hey, what time does store play for Metro? When did the Golden State Warriors play? We're actually saying these things. So, to just to get you in the mindset of where is SEO heading and what you have to optimize, and that's all I get to say, you know, where is your SEO right now, right? So if we're going from, you know, this flip phone here, you can really see that, to artificial intelligence, are you the flip phone or are you the iPhone 10, right? Or iPhone X, right? iPhone X. Um, and, you know, just to kind of 
take stock, and kind of take inventory of what you guys are doing back at your business. The good news is that you guys are here, right? So Chris and I, and AJ, and I don't know what the math is, probably 50 years of SEO, we've been in, been in it for a long time. So the good news is that if you know what keywords and content and backlinks and meta tags are, those still work, but it's how you apply, it's how you format, it's how you take action on these that have changed, right? In addition to these additional rankings. So, you know, this year's just kind of, we're not gonna kind of break them out in sections so you won't see this, but these are some of the ideas that we're gonna touch upon today. And our goal is to we'll keep walking out of here with two, three, 10, 12 things that you can go back and actually apply to. So you can actually rank number two, number one, or above that. So how can you rank above number one? And, uh, you know, I'm gonna bring up AJ for that to explain that. Thank you guys. Back at Dreamforce, uh, like Stuart said, this is my fourth year here with Chris's tour, and uh, I think the reason why we're invited back is we give actionable info. So just like Stuart just said, we're gonna give you stuff that you can go and implement right away. Last year, about a week after our session, I was getting tweets, uh, emails from people saying, I did what you guys said, and I earned a whole bunch of featured studies. So there's a lot of excitement about that. And today I'm going to show you how to rank for featured snippets in 2018, and then also how to take that same tactic and upgrade your old content. So the stuff you did in 2015, you can earn a featured snippet right away on that. Briefly about my agency, Gurgitu Company, we help people make better content. We're an SEO-driven uh, content marketing agency. We work with brands like Salesforce, Discover, Petco, but also a myriad of startups and small businesses as well. I'm going to give you a little warning. In case you didn't know, today is National Punsters Day. So I got dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So Chris and I have been optimizing for years for featured snippets. And the types of featured snippets you're trying to get are paragraphs, tables, and lists. And I already know there's somebody in the audience like, uh oh, we're going to featured feature snippet videos. You do, you do, you've seen them. Let me show you an example. So as you can see here, I don't know how to start a clock. I got 10 million matches. I warned you, I warned you. No one <laughs> um, There we go, anyway. This is a featured snippet. This is a list. So when we're talking about paragraphs, lists, and tables, they're literally just that. Let me show you one other example. Google is called Safe. Sadly, it's about to end there. They get worse, don't worry. Uh, the reason why you want a feature snippet is because it occupies position zero. So many times you can be ranking on fourth or fifth or sixth. And leapfrog your competition into position zero, you get a massive click-through rate when you have a featured snippet, and it's free. So, I mentioned I have data, I have a lot of data to walk you through, and that's thanks to SEM Rush. We did a study with them, they are a keyword research tool, a uh, content analysis tool, they're awesome, check them out. And they opened up their database to us to look at future snippets. We analyzed 80 million keywords and 1.6 million featured snippets. I wanted the data behind like how are some people getting future snippets and how are some people not? What, what does the data tell us? So my goal was to focus on questions, prepositions, and comparisons. Uh, Chris can tell you, like, for a long time, we've been telling people feature snippets predominantly show up for questions. Uh, and so now we have the data to back that up. Um, here you can see some of the data around uh, feature snippet questions. And one of the first findings that we saw in the data was, you know, four questions, they almost always get a paragraph featured snippet. I mean, look at some of these totals, 99% of the time, uh, it's a feature snippet paragraph, okay? So what that's telling you is, is if you're trying to take down a featured snippet and it's a paragraph, you're not optimizing your content, you're optimizing your paragraphs. You need to succinctly answer that question in the paragraph to earn that feature snippet. The rule breaker here is how, and that's because of how to searches. So prepositions usually get lists, and how to uh, has, has lists. I have way more data than I should, and so that bit link right there has 
tons of data on all the questions. Pass that around to the nerdiest person at your office and they'll be <laughs> really happy. Okay, let's look at prepositions. So I just mentioned that how to. They give lists. So um, any kind of how to search, you can see here, I have a toddler and he likes Mickey Mouse. So I search, uh, you know, what are Disney characters like Mickey Mouse? And give a list. And you'll see this a lot. You get usually either an unordered list like bullet points or an ordered list like steps one, two, three, four, five, where I was talking about how to build a fire. Speaking of uh, Disney, randomly one of my buddies is neighbors with uh, Rick Astley. And he says, cool dude, let's anybody borrow any of his Disney movies, except for one of them. Can anybody guess what the footage is? There we go. He's never going to give you a um... <laughs> All right. I'm waking you guys up. It's 9 a.m. Come on. All right. So, future snippets, we looked at also comparisons. Now, for small businesses out there, or anybody that wants to make money, uh, right there. When you format your information in tables at the end of a buying cycle around price or comparisons of features, you can earn feature snippets all day with tables. Now, I know the chart says, hey, paragraphs are showing up the most, but that's because most people don't put their data into tables in the first place. So Google's lacking what it wants, which is to show a table because they know from AI that people want to uh, read that data in a table format. I'll show you in a minute an example where we made no changes except for format and we earned a ton of feature snippets all at the end of the buying cycle where people were comparing price. Okay, so your overall breakdown of feature snippets. If you are going after a question, you're optimizing paragraphs. If you're going after prepositions like how to, you are optimizing for lists. And I know it's small, but I'm telling you, you'll make money if you go for price and you go for uh, comparisons uh, in tables. Okay, so you've got all that information. How do you actually optimize for features? <laughs> like I said, paragraphs and things like that. My advice to you guys would be to start, if you're dipping your toe in the water trying to earn features, is start with questions. Um, and here's why. When we looked at 80 million keywords, we found that just generic keywords, anything you type into Google, there's about a 70% chance that you'll get a featured snippet to show up. However, 41% of the time, just any question you put into Google now shows a featured snippet. That's an insane stat. Uh, it's 480% increase over you know, a generic keyword. So let that sink in. <laughs> Come on. All right. That was fun. Um, okay, so let's look at the optimal list. So I'm talking about paragraphs, right? And you're like, okay, well, how do I optimize that? <coughs> so we analyzed hundreds of thousands of these snippets. And here's what we got for Salesforce. Uh, we found on average that they're about 46 words in length. Chris and I have been telling you for years, like 40 to 60 words, that's your, your benchmark that you want to go for. Um, and so the, the takeaway is that these paragraphs need to be succinct and they need to get right to the point. No BS, just right to the point, answer the question. Um, and here you can see, this is what we got for Salesforce. They actually rank fourth. So they have the fourth position and a position zero, all for free, just because they optimize the paragraphs. Next was lists, and we found that the maximum items in a list that Google will show is eight. But I don't want you to take away from that, I should make lists one through eight. I actually want you to make a longer list where applicable, because they get truncated. And so what you want to do is give them a reason to read more. If your list is three items, Google's just going to show the answer. So you want to give them a reason to click through and read more. Um, the next was very similar with tables. So we have a pharmaceutical client um, that sells drugs and they like to make money. And so they said, well, how can we do that with future studies? We did, all we actually had them do is on their e-commerce landing pages, we instituted multiple HTML tables for their pricing charts. And right away, they just recently just did this, and I think they earned about 60 featured snippets um, all around like name brand drug and price. So right at the end of the buying cycle, dominating, taking over the server, it takes up the whole screen on mobile. And all they did was use a table to format the data, and that's what people want to see. 
Okay. Uh, we also looked at images. Feature snippets tend to have images in them, uh, very visual. Uh, the takeaway here is just go with landscape images. Uh, portrait size images tend to get pixelated even when they're shown, and uh, the aspect ratio is 4 3, so like 800 by 600, you're good to go. Uh, landscape images, and use them a lot for your content. Okay. I'm going to talk to you about something that you haven't heard about, and that's what is a feature snippet hub. I know you haven't heard about it, about it because I made it up. Um, I made it up because I was trying to, I saw something weird in the data set that we were looking at. And this blue dot here, that's your, that's your you know, homepage. The light blue dot, that's your URL, so like a blog post. The green dots are featured snippets. And what we started to find is some URLs out there are attracting, like a magnet, tons of featured snippets. We were finding some URLs with as high as 300 featured snippets that they earn for a single post, like one blog post. So it's pretty crazy. And I wanted to dive deeper into those URLs, those hubs, and see why that they were being so trusted by Google. Uh, so we found 3,800 individual URLs. Each of these URLs have 10 or more featured snippets, and I will be adding that to the bit.ly link that I talked about earlier. Um, first thing we saw, and Stuart mentioned this, it's not really an option. You have to be HTTPS. 70% um, of the featured snippets are now uh, in HTTPS URLs. It's, even on small business, it's, it's not optional. Go to HTTPS. It's cheap and easy. You can actually do it for free with less than So, a little tech trivia. Do you guys know who had the first tablet with a secure connection to the cloud? That's right. <laughs> uh, I got most, I got most of okay, I talked about media, um, video, uh, photos, anything like that to break up your content. So large usage of images uh, on these hubs. The next thing we found was that it is pretty obvious these were trusted. They are high authority uh, domains. I don't want that to discourage you if you're a small business though. If you're a small business, you're not competing against Huffington Post. You're competing against the other small business. So you can still, you know, I've earned feature snippets on Domain Authority 35 out of 100 sites. It's relative to your niche. So don't be discouraged by that. You can be a thought leader in, in your industry or local and earn tons of feature snippets at a, at a lower uh, Domain Authority. Also, about 90% of the URLs had social engagement. That's not a direct correlation. I'm just saying they made engaging content and you, that's a takeaway. You're getting content, it's not going to get engagement. That's a signal that if you're not formatting it properly. This is a big deal. This right here. We took Google's API for page speed and we ran all 3,800 of these hub URLs through it. And I was shocked by the score. The mobile for the score average for these 3,800 URLs was 95 out of 100. The usability score, 96 out of 100. And so that should get home. You know, mobile friendly is again not an option. You can't just say, oh, we have a mobile site. We have to have a really good one. Um, that, that number is way higher than I expected it to be. Uh, we also found a lot of use of HTML elements like lists and unordered lists. That unordered list is a little bit high because admittedly some of that is design, but I'll show you in just a second. Um, people aren't just doing one list, they're breaking up their content, making it easy for mobile users to scan it. Okay, here's a simple little uh, cheat sheet I made for you. I talked about, you know, earning snippets in 2018, but the easiest way to get a snippet, you can get a snippet this week. All you gotta do is go back, use a tool like SEMrush or Moz or Ahrefs, find your old content that ranks already in the top 10. And all these tools you can sort by if there's feature snippets available. If you're in the top 10, you can get the feature snippet. All you need to do is this. Rearrange your content to how you want to display. Take those text balls, eliminate them, crop it down to you know, 40 word paragraphs. Um, make sure you're mobile friendly, make sure you use lots of lists, break up that content. Submit it to Google and Chris will show you, you can get featured snippets sometimes in as little as a couple of hours on old content. So I'd like for you guys to hit me up on Twitter afterwards and be like, yeah, it worked. Okay. Last thing I'm going to show you is this is a quick anatomy of a featured snippet hub. Um, when I looked through these 3,800 URLs, I saw this over and over and over. 
It earned 96, this one page, earned 96 featured snippets to a single page. Does it have social shares? Yes. Is it uh, secure? Yes. Look at that mobile friendly score, 99 out of 100, right? So it's hitting all the things we just talked about. There are 12 health related images and charts on this guy. It's a 2,000 word count. Most of the content is long form. We found around 2,200 words. They are making uh, clear use of headers. There's 12 <coughs> subheaders, dividing up the content, making it scalable. 2,000 words, and the longest paragraph in this article is 42 words. So again, think about it on your mobile phone. You want short, right to, uh, right to the point answer. They use seven ordered and unordered lists in this content. And for all of you link juice hoarders, I know you're out there somewhere, uh, they linked out externally to 48 external sources to back up their claims. And what they did is that if they said, hey, you can lose weight like this, um, they linked to a government study backing up their claim. So if you go back to your old content, and you reformat it in this way, you can get feature snippets next week, I promise you. All right, my presentation is pinned at SEO. I'm at SEO on Twitter. And you can also get the raw data from the feature snippets on the Bitly link. Remember guys, pun day, so get those puns ready. I advise not to tell any chemistry jokes. They get no reaction. <laughs>
what AJ said, they take up rank zero. The click-through we've seen is out of control. When you see some of the case studies and the screenshots going, going forward, you'll see the, the great thing about it is it takes up like 80% of the page, right? Because you get the snippet and then you get the first ranking. Most of the time, sometimes you don't get the first ranking, you might be rank six or four or five, but you take up so much real estate and that's just that's a marketer's dream. Uh, Snippets are new, but they're still definitely the wild, wild west. Google is still trying to figure out things, and that's really good for us as marketers. So for example, if you search who is the best superhero in Google, you'll get this snippet, and it says Batman's number one. Now I agree that Batman is definitely number one. Um, but, and so maybe Google is biased, maybe there is someone that tweaked that, maybe Sergi likes Batman better than Superman. But, uh, but when you go to Cora's page, you'll see that Superman is listed as number one. And so Google still is figuring out the snippets. They still don't really know everything. Um, they're still always tweaking, and that's a really good thing for marketers because that means they're going to be updating all the time, which will give us a lot of data. Uh, we'll see a lot of changes and tweaks, and um, it's something that we as marketers can take advantage of. So you can say there is a plethora of opportunity for featured snippets. I've had to do a dad joke too. Um, that's my beautiful. Um, Stat did a really good study on the volatility of featured snippets. So this is a really good study to go along with the SEM Rush study. You can get more data than you could possibly ever dream for. Um, you can go to this link below, and I tweeted out my presentation earlier, but they broke through and researched on why the snippets change all the time, why they were volatile, which ones were, which ones weren't, things like that. So again, kind of back to the Superman example, you can get some data as to why maybe Google's figuring things out, and that's something you can Okay, let's get into what we use at 97.4 to take the snippet. So first things first, we use relevant semantic related content. And we use a tactic called TFIDF, which I'm going to go to on the second half of my session. That works really, really well. We always make sure we have subheader tags um, related to the keywords and the snippets and the, thing, the target that we're going after. Just like AJ said, 40 to 60 words is kind of that magic spot. Um, and obviously you want to use keywords in there. So after you do that, you want to, you know, so you want to do number one, which would be the last slide, revise the copy, then use Google Search Console to fetch and submit so that you can get indexed right away, and you can literally see it within a couple hours, but you should give it about 10 days. If you don't get it within 10 days, you've got more tweaking to do, you've got more work to do. Um, and sometimes you might never get it, I'll have some examples of that later, but um, for the most part, you should be able to see it in 10 days if you did it right. So try again, tweak. Um, this is just another example. So two years ago, I, I shared this um, in Dreamforce, and we had gotten a snippet. It's still there. So that shows me a couple things. One, we definitely know how to do this stuff. But two, even though there's humongous recipe sites out there, and Kale Smoothie is a humongous keyword that gets insane traffic, like 30 plus, 50,000 50, plus visitors a month to this page from that keyword. Um, no one's still, you know, we don't have a lot of competition. No one's really figuring it out. No one, there's still a lot of, um, no, no one's come and dethroned us or anything. We haven't done anything. We haven't touched it. If any of you have a recipe site and this goes down the sand, I'm going to be excited. <laughs> I'm going to come back. Um, so that that's, you know, just to kind of touch on AJ's work. But I want to talk about something really cool we've seen as we've optimized for snippets over the last couple of years. It's an awesome, awesome <coughs> side effect. So. We've seen rankings actually increase just by optimizing for the snippet, regardless of whether we get the snippet or not. So this is an example of one we did for help Stewart with the Salesforce advantages of SaaS. We optimized for the snippet. It was number three with no snippet. We got number one, and we got uh, we got the snippet up at the top. I mean, again, look at the real estate that's taking up right there for Salesforce. That's insane for a really good keyword too. Someone who's you know trying to research why they should go SaaS. Um, that's awesome. But what was cool is so as we were going after a bunch of these words, we started to see ranking improvements regardless um, of whether we got the snippet or not. So you can use it actually as a ranking um, strategy. So for example, the word SaaS, we optimized for the snippet. We were number five and we moved up to number three. We didn't get the snippet at all. So everything we did to try to get it moved us up on a humongous keyword, SaaS, um, to number three. We're now above the fold. But we didn't get the snippet. We probably never will on this one because it's Wikipedia and it's more you know high level in general. We're still going to go for it, but really, really huge benefits in traffic for that. And that was our own. That was the strategy that we implemented on that. Um, 
here's some other keywords where we did. They didn't get the snippet, but they all moved up um, in ranking just by going after it. So if you got a keyword that's kind of stuck, you need to unhinge or things like that, you should do this just to move that up regardless of whether you get the snippet or not. Especially on really competitive stuff. So here's an example from Dr. Axe. Uh, I apologize the big screen messed up my arrows, but uh, the um, it was number three in May. We optimized for that. We didn't get the snippet because this one actually has a knowledge card on the other side of the page where it, it, Wikipedia is showing like all the macronutrients and how many carbs it has and protein and things like that. Um, but we did move up to number one for that humongous keyword. And again, it was using that tactic. Now, HubSpot is optimizing from the start. A lot of these examples, we went back and kind of re-optimized those pages. You can start to see now this is such a big priority for big sites um, like HubSpot, where they're just putting this in right from the beginning on their blog post. So as you can see, this is one blog post. They got two different images that are set up to be you know, snippet related, and they're just throwing it out there right in their content from the get go. Here's another blog post that we're part of those of see, or those of the uh, up post versions. And then Here's another blog post where they did it again and they put the list above. See, normally that blog post would say, what is a qualified prospect up at the top? And then you have all the meat underneath it, but they know how important snippets are and how important the optimization of it is, and so they're just doing it right from the get-go. It's awesome. But they're making it um, still work really well for the user by, you know, saying, use this table, you know, things like that. Sense. And that's something to remember is Google's always fighting for the user. They're always trying to make um, everything better for us as users. So you need to always keep that in mind and be, be ahead of that. So um, I want to transition into my second part of my main tactics that I'm talking about today. And it's taking your old on page SEO skills to the next level using TFIDF, which is term frequency inverse document frequency. It's a big um, mouthful, but let me kind of break it down real quick, and I know some things that's going to make it really easy. It's one of the first things that Google put into their patch on their search algorithm patch, is that they use term frequency analysis to, um, to look at documents and to categorize them, so it's very important. It's been around since the beginning, but not a lot of people are taking advantage of it. Um, <clears throat> It looks at the size of the document, how much the terms are in there, and then that, it also kind of divides it and looks at all the other documents and how much they use the terms, but not just the keyword, all the semantically related terms too. And I'll, I have an example that will make it easier to explain. So what it does is it helps you learn the semantically relevant words, phrases, and themes that Google's looking for outside of your main keyword. So I feel like before when we did, I'll show you an example. Before when we did on-page SEO, We'd use this old abacus method, which would be, you know, looking at how many times we mentioned chia seed on the page, and let's add chia seed uh, benefits and chia seed nutrition and calories. Okay, we're number three. Let's tweak it some more and add some more chia seed words and really kind of play around there. Um, what? Or we maybe go to Hooper Suggest and be like, oh, give me some more keywords that I can, you know, work into my article or things like that. But what TFIDF does is it tells you exactly what you need to do to dominate in your space because it's looking at all your competitors and helping you create your content. It's also really good for your writing team because you're going to hand them a list of topics to write about instead of, like, here you go, writers, cram these words into your articles and the whole, like, SEO versus writers and content team. Now you're going to give them topics, semantics, things like that, so they can just kind of be more free will to write um, and they'll know exactly what to do. So for example, for that word, chia seed, what we did, we didn't add the word chia one more time on that page to get that number one ranking. We added words like the, the original name for the chia seed, or the real name, which is uh, Hispanica salvia. We were, added words like antioxidant, and flax, and things like that. No, we didn't touch the word chia at all, or the word chia seed. And then we got that number one ranking. So we used this really cool tool called Write that you can use, um, that makes it super easy to understand. So if you look at the orange bars, that's breaking down all the terms that are being used in documents that are ranking for chia seeds. But then it's showing you know, how many times they are, and then the green bar is me putting in the Dr. X chia seed URL, so then it compares, it will compare your URL, all you're trying to optimize, to the graph. 
so you can kind of know what's out there. Now, one thing to point out, you'll see some words like about seven or so from the left, advertisement. Like, obviously, that's just because this tool is grabbing every keyword on the page. You don't need to optimize for the word advertisement to rank better for GFC. Uh, that's because it's grabbing some, you know, banner ads or whatever. But you want to look at what's relevant. And so the words that we really need to change were the ones that I circled, and that took us from, you know, the middle of the page to number one. And here's a guess, any guesses to which day we implemented TFIDF on the GSD page? Yep, you guessed it. It's crazy what it does. And uh, I mean, we're talking about going from like 4,000 users a day to that page, to 35 to 40,000 users a day to that page by adding you know, three or four different words to the copy and um, uh, and knowing exactly what to do because TFIDF does that for you. TFIDF will awaken the beast. It'll unleash the mind, the mind player, um, and uh, help your content get kicked into gear. So here's another example from Dr. X. So we did it for sore throat, same thing, and we saw all the different semantically, you know, all the topically related words that we were missing. We needed to add. We did this in October. We added words like pneumatic and lozenges and mononucleosis and things like that. Again, we didn't touch the word sore throat. Um, so far, we've only moved up a page, right? We've only moved up from page four to page three, which is fine, but that doesn't mean we're not getting a lot of new traffic for the word sore throat. But look what happened after doing that. Our traffic started to climb and climb and double and over triple, and it's continuing to do it because all those other semantically related words we added, Google now sees this as a more authoritative page on sore throat, so now we're ranking for all those other variations too. And, um, it totally just extends us kind of horizontally for that kind of keyword and um, topic. This is, Dr. X is a feature snippet hub, like what AJ was talking about, and they have pages, some of their pages get hundreds of snippets, and this is um, a main reason for that. So right now, you want to go back through your live content, just like AJ was saying, and you want to re-optimize. So you literally can go back through, look at pages that are kind of stuck, or that you need to do, and use that right tool, use some of the feature snippet the tactics, and you can definitely kind of unhinge that and make it better. Where this works really, really well is when you need to increase in niche relevancy. You already produce a lot of long-form content, um, or you have a large set of content, but where so that, but it works for everybody, but those are areas where you can see really, really good results right away. Last year, AJ and I were messing around with some of these tactics on the way home on the plane. We were on separate planes, but we were chatting with each other, and literally by the next morning, we had snippets for different pages we were optimizing for, and stuff. So it works really, really well if you do it right. Um, and you've got to make sure you're doing the TFIDF as part of that, part of the snippet optimization in your on page. Because if your competitors are giving to you are not doing it right now, and literally it's taken Dr. X from you know number seven or number eight in their industry to about it out for number one. Um, they were they were you know small company a couple years ago, and they were number thirty five fastest growing company in America this year. And uh, their the website traffic has been astronomical. So go back right away, get that done, and I hope that um, it will it will help you out. You can see some quick wins right away. And uh, I'm at Chris Bennett on Twitter, and I'm more than happy to always help out with questions, answers, help me work through this. I love this stuff. Um, I, it works really, really, really well, and uh, that's it for me. Thank you.